Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Prabhu. Uh, I'm part of an LVM toolchain team at Google, and we focus on low-level operating systems. Uh, we follow an upstream first uh, development principle when it comes to LVM uh, development, and we continuously build and ship our toolchain uh, to our customers. Uh, in the past, our tech lead, uh, Peter Hosek, has given a comprehensive overview of how one of our projects, Fuchsia, has co-evolved with the LVM toolchain, uh, and how that principle not only helped improve Fuchsia, but also helped uh, take the toolchain uh, into interesting uh, directions. And we are bringing the same kind of approach to uh, Embedded now. Um, and why are we focusing on Embedded? Um, for Embedded projects, like the motivation, I want to uh, do it from two perspectives. Uh, if you are somebody who uh, has an Embedded project, why should you uh, move to the LLVM toolchain? Uh, from our conversations with the uh, Embedded engineers, uh, it appears that uh, it is uh, ubiquitous that uh, these engineers work with uh, memory constrained devices, and the binary size is a huge concern here. And um, it, all, it also seems like the tool chains that uh, these projects use uh, are often forked from upstream uh, GNU tool chains. Uh, and then on top of the uh, fork, uh, some additional uh, logic has been added uh, to support the embedded use cases and shipped to the uh, projects. Uh, since these projects are not upstream uh, and also don't get often uh, updated, uh, it's hard to improve these tool chains. Uh, even teams like us, uh, who are full of compiler engineers and, and company like Google, which has like uh, hundreds of um, uh, compiler engineers, cannot really help improve these tool chains uh, because these, these are uh, forked from upstream. Uh, so to enable these embedded projects to get continuous improvements uh, from the tool chain point of view, uh, to address hard problems like binary size, and also enable them to use the rich tooling available in the uh, LLVM ecosystem, and unlock interesting uh, optimization opportunities such as LTO uh, and ML inliner and so on, uh, it is um, imperative that the embedded projects use the LVM toolchain. Uh, and for the LVM community, um, I want to uh, uh, emphasize that the number of projects in this space is like continuing to grow uh, within Google and also across the industry. Uh, and it brings like a lot of interesting challenges and problems that as a compiler engineer or a linker engineer, uh, it's interesting to work on. And um, these problems are not just uh, going to help the embedded projects solving them, uh, it also uh, is going to help in a lot of domains uh, because everybody likes their binaries to be smaller and, and uh, all the other nice things we want to do for embedded is going to extend beyond this uh, domain. Uh, in our effort over the last year, uh, Pigweed uh, is our uh, one of our partners. Uh, Pigweed team is also part of Google. Uh, Pigweed maintains an open source collection of embedded targeted libraries. If you're somebody who want to get started on an embedded project, this is a one-stop shop place uh, to go and get started. Pigweed packages, uh, among other things, um, lightweight logging, uh, RPC for your embedded projects, uh, interesting support for uh, different flavors of your C++, like 17, 20, uh, and, uh, and also like Pigweed happens to be an open source project. And, um, and one more thing that Pigweed does is to ship the LVM toolchain we build uh, from out of the box. Um, and several projects within Google, including our flagship projects, use Pigweed. Uh, we started working with one of the uh, customers of Pigweed, which is PixelBuds Pro. Uh, it is a real project that is shipped to the uh, customers and uses Pigweed. Uh, it is um, a real, uh, it, as real as it gets with complex architecture, which has multiple ARM Cortex series architectures in it, uh, lots of cores, and each of these cores employ different flavors of um, artosis, and these cores share uh, code between them as well. Uh, and this project, this project uh, also has severe binary size constraints. And for the application code for one of the cores um, that's available to them is like hundreds of kilobytes. Um, and this project uh, has hundreds of developers uh, developing across different architect, uh, different platforms such as Windows, Mac, and Linux, as well as millions of users. Uh, a little bit of a spoiler alert here: uh, we the last week there is a software update announced for the PixelBuds Pro. It is actually compiled and shipped. Uh, with our uh, LLVM toolchain. Uh, the rest of the talk, I want to bifurcate it into two parts. The first part is our experience of working with PixelBuds Pro. What did the effort take? So if you're an embedded uh, project owner, uh, if you're trying to like move away from a GNU toolchain to a Clang toolchain, what you can expect uh, in this experience, as well as uh, the second part on like what we should do as a LLVM community, where we should go from here. Um, so our approach to porting was um, is, is well informed by the previous efforts uh, moving from other tool chains to LVM. Um, the idea is simple. Uh, we will do this incrementally, one target at a time, 
and one toolchain component at a time, which is like compiler first, linker next, and so on. And we also wanted to maintain backward compatibility uh, with the GNU toolchain. So this allowed us to build trust with the product teams so that uh, they can continue to build their features and like ship it on time um, without worrying about whether this transition will affect their deadlines or not. Once we started uh, switching out the compiler, um, the first few things that we noticed was better diagnostics. We were able to like catch some bugs in the code, as well as the warnings that the Clang uh, produced directly helped us improve the code quality. And these are like some of the um, uh, low controversial uh, patches that we have sent out. Uh, everybody was on the opinion that in general, it just helped improve the product quality. Uh, the second part was to uh, switch out the linker. Um, the, this introduced, uh, this rather surfaced a lot of interesting challenges. Um, for the embedded projects, the memory layout is uh, really important, the control over it. And the uh, main tool that they have, have in their arsenal is linker scripts. And uh, when we started like switching out the linker, uh, we noticed that the uh, linker script semantics that are accepted by the different versions of the linkers uh, varied. So we had to like be carefully uh, uh, change the linker um, script syntax so that the LLD can like uh, accept this linker script. And in this um, uh, slide to your right, I've shown like a very simple version of a linker script. Here, there is like two different memory regions. These represent like two different parts of the uh, hardware. Uh, these are disjoint memory regions. And what the programmers here are trying to do is to pack the object files into these two different memory regions. The primary goal here is to just pack the contents of the binary into these memory regions because the binary size is like stringent. Um, in situations like this, we notice that it is a hard problem to solve like manually. Uh, there is no real way to do this automatically from linker today. So uh, we had to like, whenever we change code, uh, when the object file sizes changes, this has to be done manually to like pack the objects across um, the, the different memory regions that are available uh, to the uh, engineers, which is a tedious process. We also noticed some more minor challenges in like moving away from the BFT linker to LD. Uh, one is the symbol resolution logic varies in like um, uh, minor ways, uh, especially with respect to archive files. So we had to maintain different um, order of like uh, linker flags for two different versions of the tool chains, as well as the um, link maps that are produced by two different linkers, uh, the BFT and LLD in this case are different. So if you had to like investigate what changed between the two artifacts that like were produced, it's not an easy question to answer by just looking at the link maps because these are not like one is to one comparisons. So we had to add some more scripting on top of the link maps to understand and like reason about the uh, contents of the binary that is produced. Once we got things compiled, linked, and made it fit in the memory, uh, we tried to run, these, uh, run the artifact on the uh, device. Uh, that led to some runtime failures. Uh, the first class of failures I want to highlight, um, this is just to give you a taste of like what to expect. Um, so the, when we started transitioning out, we first switched out one particular target uh, in the product. The other targets continued to uh, use the GNU toolchain. Uh, and when these toolchains had like different defaults, uh, for example, in this case, the uh, short enum was set by the ARM GCC compiler, but not the LVM toolchain. And when these code started interacting and, and sharing data, there were like layout mismatches in the structs, uh, sorry, the enums, uh, and that resulted in like runtime failures. So first identifying these defaults and like making sure that all the different tool chains in your uh, ecosystem have the uh, same behavior is, is like the first part of getting past these failures. Uh, the second class of failures uh, are some of the latent bugs that got surfaced uh, in this uh, exercise. Uh, these bugs can also be uh, seen as like something that could have uh, like ticking time bombs. This could have exposed, uh, been exposed due to other reasons by changing the code itself or even just updating the GNU toolchain as well. Uh, so this is a contrived example of one of the crashes we hit uh, here in uh, inline assembly code, which has some input and like output variables. Uh, if these uh, input and output variables receive the same register, this code is going to fail uh, because the input, input um, will be overwritten before it is fully consumed. Um, there is a way to like address this in inline assembly. Uh, it needs an early clobber uh, constraint. Uh, this is this inline assembly is missing. So the fix is simple uh, that we have to like um, include this um, uh, constraint. But uh, the larger problem here is that uh, these kind of like minor issues can be harder to like identify and fix. Uh, but the general consensus is like this is somewhat of a buggy code. Just happened to work, and we were able to like identify these bugs and fix it. 
Uh, one more such issue was uh, race condition. Um, this was an obvious uh, issue, like debugging was hard, but, but the problem is obvious. Uh, the two different threads for like trying to access uh, a data structure without locking, um, which resulted in a race condition. This once again uh, could have happened in the GNU toolchain as well. For whatever reason, the code gens were like different. In GNU, it wasn't surfaced, and when we tried using the, uh, our toolchain, uh, this came up and we were able to identify and fix the application code. Um, the last kind of class of uh, problems that we face that I want to like mention here is uh, with, with respect to the stack sizes. Um, for today, like if you're an embedded engineer, there is no real comprehensive stack usage analysis available to you. Uh, so if, uh, for every thread that you want to uh, uh, allocate stack size for, this is done more of a trial and error basis. You just run your workload for your given thread and then see what is the high watermark and then you just allocate stack size based on that. Um, and when we actually switched out the tool chain, um, we noticed that the uh, stack size is sensitive to the inlining decisions made by uh, your tool chain. So uh, since we changed the tool chain, the inlining decisions changed. This changed the sizes of the stacks. Uh, stack usage, this resulted in some of the failures. Um, and to address these, uh, though we don't have like a comprehensive analysis today to like just solve this problem forever, uh, we were able to like at least uh, do uh, the debugging better with um, uh, the Clang LLVM toolchain. Uh, for example, Clang LLVM has excellent support for understanding the stack frame, uh, st stack frame layouts. Um, and uh, we, we were able to use it to like inquire about the stack sizes for uh, stack frame usages. And uh, here's an example where we had like one of the functions uh, had like an abnormal size of the stack. And when we used this flag, it was able to point out to a, uh, the reason for the stack size bloat, which was inlining of this function, which had some large variables on stack. Um, so these were like some examples of like the kind of crashes we uh, were able to like identify and fix in the product code. Uh, as things stand, uh, we were able to like switch out the compiler and linker for this particular project and able to ship it to the customers. Uh, the other thing we tried to do is to switch out the new lib nano that is used by this project to use the LLVM libc. Um, we were able to like verify that uh, this is possible. We were able to build and like test it on the device and it works. Um, we tried a, uh, a strategy of building this code from uh, source directly as in um, when we build the application code, uh, this is small enough, so we were able to also build the library along with the application code, uh, and we were able to uh, verify that, that this worked. Uh, with respect to the other components in the tool chain, uh, this is a larger conversation to be had. I'll touch upon them uh, in a second. So this brings us to the second part about the future directions that we see. Uh, just a quick note here, uh, we had a four hour workshop yesterday talking about this. So the next seven minutes is not going to do any justice to this topic. Uh, this is gonna be an ongoing conversation, but I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the things we would like to see. Uh, there are really like a lot of low hanging fruits out here that can make it really easy for the embedded projects to embrace the LLVM toolchain. Uh, one of the things that we want to see down the line is uh, link time optimization to be used in embedded spaces. What is blocking us today is that uh, the linker scripts have assumptions that doesn't account for LTO compilation. Uh, some of the initial experiments that we did uh, suggest that there could be up to 10% size savings possible for some of our products, but we couldn't like fully verify the artifact because um, it's not uh, verifiable yet. Um, one of our team members is actually like prioritizing this work and like working on it. We would like to see this uh, support land upstream. And this is a miscellaneous like LLD wish list. Um, one of the things that I touched upon already, uh, already is the automatic object packing support. Uh, for example, the uh, BFT linker has this uh, flag, which is to enable non-contiguous memory regions. Um, this is supposed to work uh, seamlessly. Um, this support does not exist with LLD today, and we would really like to see this be implemented. Uh, one of the other features that is used heavily in the embedded space is overlays. Um, and the overlays can be used in interesting ways to uh, save a binary size. Uh, and one of the key components for overlays to work correctly is this no cross-ref support. Uh, which is missing in LLD, uh, which is once again, we want to prioritize. Uh, some of the other improvements include machine readable format for link, link maps, which is one of the earlier problems I had touched upon. Uh, if you could have like machine readable uh, format, then comparing it with like a GNU format link map would be easier. Uh, the scripting will be a little bit more consistent. We could even upstream it. Um, and we have a whole other bunch of uh, bugs that we have like filed against LLD. The wish list here uh, is, is uh, available. Um, for you to like check out. 
And there are some more involved problems. Uh, for example, the libc++ support for uh, embedded, there is no real clear way forward yet. Uh, we have started having this conversation with the uh, maintainers and also from the embedded um, developers on what do they want to see. So there's some of the challenges like ABI stability and the bloat that is introduced when you're using uh, libc++ uh, and, and the configurability for uh, bare metal systems uh, are all open questions. Uh, we would like to see some movement here. Uh, the other problem I had touched upon again as well, precise tax size analysis is missing. Um, so there is one thing to come up with the conservative analysis from the, uh, from the tool chain, and where do we go from there? How can we make this analysis actionable for the embedded project so that they can decide on like how much stack to allocate for each of their threads? Uh, this problem, once again, um, can extend beyond uh, the embedded um, uh, domain. We've been um, looking at like a lot of discourse posts where uh, this is like a much coveted feature. Uh, so we would like to also uh, work on this in the near future. And some of the other uh, problems include um, uh, challenges with the instrumentation, with the lack of binary size, um, uh, with the lack of the binary space available for the binaries. Um, it is hard to instrument and collect profiles from the target. Uh, same goes with like running sanitizers. These are again uh, open-ended problems. Uh, we are like looking at all the solutions that are available, uh, and, and we are continuing to discuss this uh, and, and all of these problems in uh, some of the forums uh, that are available to us. Uh, I want to highlight one such the forum in the summary, uh, which is the LLBM Embedded uh, Toolchains Working Group. This meets monthly. Uh, this is one place where we've been uh, coming together as a team and working with some of the other major players from the industry as well. Uh, to talk about these problems and, and kind of shape the design uh, for some of these hard problems uh, and, and where we can go from here. And a quick summary, um, we have shipped a real-world embedded project with the Clang LVM toolchain and shipped it. Um, are we done? Is this enough? Um, our answer is we are barely scratching the surface. Uh, the LLVM-based toolchains have the potential to become uh, the de facto toolchain for embedded projects, but we have a long way to go. Uh, even some of the uh, use cases I've like shown with the linker and linker scripts uh, are very simple, uh, and we know in the real world that there, there are several more complex uh, linker scripts exist, uh, and we need a way forward for these projects to uh, start using our toolchain, uh, and we should start working towards it. Uh, and offering first class support to these embedded uh, scenarios uh, can have far reaching positive consequences uh, and can have impact um, uh, beneficially across different domains. Well, uh, that's all I have uh, for the talk. Uh, thanks for your attention. Okay, we can open it for a Q&A. Thank you, Prabhu. Hi, Prabhu. Thanks too, for the great talk. Uh, so I wanted to know what, are the, what is the current status of uh, LLDB as a debugger for the embedded tool chains or the embedded applications? Is there any uh, progress on that side? Um, the answer is we are looking into it. Uh, that's the status. Uh, I can. Uh, I am not well informed about what exactly the current status, but it's one of the goals that we are like uh, seriously looking into. Uh, what are the problems the embedded uh, users have uh, when it comes to debugging, and how can LLDB can be, uh, um, you know, beneficial for them? So, uh, just wanted to know if there is a sort of uh, just like the compiler and the libraries and the linker. Is there a uh, desire from the community to have LLDB as a replacement for GDB in the embedded applications, or it's uh, just in the evaluation state? Yeah, um, my answer is kind of not going to be very precise here, because um, from our experience with the embedded teams that we worked with, um, not everybody uses the debugger today. So this could be a reason because that the debuggers are not good enough for these situations. Um, so we ha that's one thing we had to look at. Uh, and the other thing is sometimes it's just hard. Uh, if there are crashes that are like in the very early part of like um, uh, boot up, that it fails. And especially if uh, the hardware architecture does not allow us to like connect the debugger, uh, those are like challenges that are inherent for the embedded domain and, and we need like better solutions there. But uh, we, have, we do have a, a desire like uh, as a team uh, to like see what we can do to like improve the status quo uh, and, and uh, offer that through LLDB. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I work on, <coughs> wow, these mics are weird. 
I work on mobile, which has like some similar constraints, particularly around code size, both for the compiler and the standard library. Uh, I have some issues I found, for example, that I was thinking might be interested for this work as well. Do you have a standard issue tag or something you use to draw attention to people working in the embedded space to particular things? Or like, what's the best way to kind of collaborate on some of this stuff? Um, so if you're asking where to like have these conversations, uh, I would highly encourage you to check out the monthly LVM Embedded Working Group meeting. And in this conference tomorrow, we are having a round table at 11 o'clock as well. Um, and you can also reach out to me. I'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, there was a slide that showed that LibC was experimental. What are the shortcomings that you've seen? Um, to be honest, like it was pretty smooth. Like it was experimental because we didn't like test it enough yet, and we didn't ship it, so we don't want to claim it as like it's done. Uh, so we were able to like for the use cases that we had for the applications, we uh, whatever the LibC surface that we required. Um, we worked with the, uh, the upstream uh, partners, like the LVM Lipsy team, to uh, get those implementations. And then with consultation from them, we were able to like uh, link against the Lipsy code and, and get it to work. And how smooth did you find the process of customizing it for your targets? The build pipelining um, was the, the only part that was like challenging. But like we noticed that the Lipsy functions, at least like the projects that we had used, wasn't that different in terms of implementation from what the new Live Nano was doing. Uh, but what we were able to do though, like what's interesting for us here was to be able to like build it from source. Uh, this also bypasses the need to have multi-lib support from the uh, tool chain. So if you want to like get and like try and experiment it with it, it's just possible to you know, check out the code as a sub-module and just build it with the same flags that you use for your application code, as long as the code bases are like small enough, I think it's it's feasible. Thank you. Thanks. Hey Prabhu, thanks hey. for the shout out. Love it, appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, I wanna call attention to like the stack usage kind of stuff. I would say, especially for embedded contexts, we typically have very fixed stack sizes. And in particular, if Clang is not competitive with other tool chains in terms of stack usage, it actually can not only result in like issues with tool chain portability and moving back and forth between tool chains, but can result in security issues because you know, we, if we can't get our code to fit in the amount of stack space allocated, there's no way we can even think about running the sanitizers because ASAN will frequently kind of blow out the stack usage by roughly an order of eight, typically, kind of thing. Um, you know, we don't have really great tools to particularly visualize. Like the compiler says, stack frame's too large. Why? You know, it's not always easy for developers to tease out. But um, from recent investigations, I would say that uh, Clang does a pretty poor job generally of generating lifetime markers in LOVM IR. Um, and I think in LOVM, we can add verifier checks to say you have large alokas, um, and those alokas don't have lifetime intrinsics around them. And that can contribute, basically, stack slot coloring has to be conservative and say this thing gets its own unique stack slot for the duration of the function, and that cannot be shared with anything else. And that leads to excessive stack usage in my experiment. And from there, from like verifier failures, we can then map those back to what language construct produced these stack allocations. And in my experience, different languages have different rules, especially around the lifetime of temporaries, like very totally. complex rules around the lifetimes of temporaries. Mm -hmm. And you know, per language version, those can change as well. And so I think Clang basically says like, you know, I don't know what the right answer is. So just be conservative and say like, use as much stack as possible, and that's that's very painful for embedded developers. No, totally. Thanks for the comment. And like, like the applications for this can like uh, be beneficial in like a lot of cases. Even inlining decisions today do not account for like stack sizes, right? So you inlined and made the binary smaller, but if you blow up the stack, then what's the point? And so there's yeah, we have a lot of interest in it. I'll definitely come and talk to you for sure. Thanks. Yeah, I'm wondering uh, after doing this, what part, how much of the effort was sort of automatable into like, especially the scripting languages between the linkers? How much was sort of mechanistically convertible? And how much was were missing features, in, you know, that we need to expand into? And did you capture some of that mechanistic stuff in mm -hmm. scripts we can use? Totally, yes. Um, categorically, um, I, 
like I mentioned, like our linker script wasn't that complex. Yes, it was challenging, but uh, it wasn't that complex. We were able to like work with what LLD offers today and able to ship something. Uh, but we also identified some of the pain points like with respect to um, some syntax uh, problems. And, and also we noticed that uh, the linker scripts, whenever we worked with them, uh, especially with LLD, uh, the ordering, um, like LLD is like a lot more sensitive to the way uh, in the order in which we define sections sometimes. Uh, so we had to be like really like careful with the way the linker script works. Sometimes it was tailor error. Um, and some of the other bugs we've noticed from the linker, uh, some of them are like really low hanging fruits and, and can be done uh, pretty fast. Um, mm -hmm. and, and others might require like longer time and, and some sort of like discussion with the upstream maintainers as well and what's acceptable. Uh, but once again, I can uh, send you the, the like wish list link and also watch out for that uh, discourse post that we will be posting, uh, which will be a summary of like the conversation we had yesterday uh, on this close to an hour uh, about LD. Thanks. Uh, would you would you say that the differences between BFD and LDD and the differences there and in, in, in GCC or in GNU were similar in in scope of cha of differences to what we have? It's a little bit larger. Is is how I would put it. Like mm -hmm. yes, there is a little bit more the linker has to do. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I just feel like it's just natural for GNU or like the BFD linker to like think about the embedded use cases. I feel like they have had a head start and, and as a community we have, uh, we could do better um, right from like basic diagnostic support uh, to the larger things like um, what happens if I take a linker script that works with GNU BFD, I just throw it in, in a you know, LLD against it. Uh, can we do better in terms of like at least suggesting what are all the failures and how can you go about fixing it uh, through documentation and other means. Um, they exist in like bits and parts through blog posts and, and, and stuff. Uh, but, but we can definitely do better. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's give a big round of applause for Prabhu. Thank you.